Hello there, and welcome back to Friendly Ties. Today, we're going to be talking about a interesting board game. We're going to be talking about Empire's End. So, Empire's End, guys. Do you like your empire? (laughs) (laughs) This is a weird game. Yeah. And what a title, though. Like, I actually, you know, a credit to that. I, I kind of like, <laughs> like this game. So if, if there's anything to know about this game, it's about the end of an empire, um, which is what Nick told me when I asked him <laughs> what it was. <laughs> but it, it, it really it really says it all. Um, it's just if you feel a sense of doom when you hear that, that is that is that is what you will feel as you uh, embark on this journey. The theme drew me to the game. Yeah, Nick, you're the reason we played it. Like, I think for the last like month and a half, every time we got together to play a game, you're like, well, we could play Empire's End. And that's actually unusual for Nick. Like, usually Nick just plays, you know, whatever Anastasia and I foist upon him. So, <laughs> yeah. First of all, I'm running a D&D campaign with the theme of an Empire's End. And so, like, there's a very personal <laughs> connection with it. Sure. But that being said, I like a negative victory point game. And I had the suspicion hmm. that it was kind of like a negative victory point game. It's not. Uh, um, but that's what I thought it might be uh, at the at the beginning when I kind of grabbed onto the idea of it. Yeah, so this yeah. is like a uh, inverse tableau builder. Like you, you start with like eleven happy little cards in front of you, and they make you stuff. And then as the game goes on, it just all burns, like literally. Burn. <laughs> yeah, like literally. I, I guess when we say like thematically, okay. So the idea, right, is that you have you have we each have our own empire represented yeah. by those twelve cards, right? And then I, and then it's, uh, yeah, yeah, this is like slowly destroyed. Like your role is not necessarily to prevent the destruction of your empire, but to like slow down the destruction of your empire, but also prevent it. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? And the, like the scheme of things, what do you think we're doing? Like, who, like, who are we? What is our role? I do <laughs> think the, the like, yeah, right. The, Cause at the end of the game, it's no one's no one's tableau or 11 cards or empire however like thematic or literal you want to get with it is completely wiped out right Right. like you are stemming the bleeding as much as you can and you do get some benefits powers along the way that you can use to modify what you still have left uh so you're you're trying to make the best of things that are are falling apart right the game is it comes from a a negative space in terms of like the actions and i think one way that that really came out in our games the two of you constantly were like i'm so stressed i like yes i can't i can't have this thing coming my way <laughs> like, like and my i'm a little bit more mercenary pounding. so i don't think i had the same <laughs> the same like emotional reaction but it's i think it's that's probably to me kind of the like flagship unique thing that this game had with the, was this idea of just like this sense of loss Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. which yeah. I enjoyed, but I think, and I think the two of you enjoyed it too, but also yeah. there were times where you're like, ah, oh, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's definitely a concept in gaming. I forget the name of it exactly of, you know, it, it, if I was to give you 25 victory points or I was to take away 25 victory points from you, they're, they're functionally the same, but they feel different like losing the right. 25 points feels right. way worse than getting like like if you start with 25 and you go to zero it's way yeah anyway and this game leans so hard into that emotion uh like this is probably one of the more emotion uh sparking euro games i've played in a long time you know not just like yeah. oh i want to win but just like dread and terror about what's about to come next and i think that's because you know as i said it's like a tableau destroyer but it, it it's also a tableau builder like you have these 11 cards and over the course of the game you're going to be adding little customized powers to the bottom of these cards and you get to activate them at various times and you you I don't I I get an affinity to those cards like you make combos like oh this card over here is going to give me extra resources as long as it's next to a road so I put a road next to it but now my road is maybe going to burn and then my combo goes away and I like my combo I put that together and how do I defend this and you know like I just and you know that combo is worth 17 points just on the card itself it's like all these things kind of compound into uh well, it's so the way I played it. So one, we play this game twice, and what I noticed over these two plays is the three of us had kind of different uh, strategies, or maybe not even strategy, but like 
uh, emotional reactions to it and uh, and mechanical reactions. Like I played both of these games trying to keep my empire unburnt as possible. So in this game, if you're familiar with the game No Thanks, um, it, it's a similar kind of thing where like destruction is coming on the third card and now we all have an auction to see who gets hit. And essentially you pay resources to not have your third card destroyed and then whoever you know ends up having the third card destroyed gets all the resources everybody paid. So maybe it was worth it. Um, and I spent both of these games uh, barely burning anything and and running like having almost no money, no resources behind my screen. It just terrified. I think that's why I was so scared because I I was so close to the precipice every single round because I kept paying you two to have your empires burn and mine wasn't burning. But I was just it, it was, you know, I was in a really fragile uh, uh, game state through much of it. I think that there's something so key to like what you said, too, about this idea of that you're like you're like. You, you're building your tableau. You're building your engine, if you will. It is an engine, Nick. It uh, right. <laughs> I wouldn't agree, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, fine. You're building your tableau here. But when John talks about this idea of, you know, you, you have these cards that give you these little abilities. The part you left out, John, is that you only get those cards. Not only, but you primarily, primarily get those cards from destroying parts of your empire so you know it, the basic function of this game is we each have our tableau of uh actually it's 11 cards our tableau of 11 cards and then there's a like a main board and that board is just a track it's a set track you'll play the same track every game and i would say there's three types of spots but primarily there are destruction spots and that's yeah. that plays out with what john described which is basically a card comes out, it's a slot of one of those 11, and that spot is what is threatened. And one of you is going to destroy that spot. And so that's what the auction is, is essentially, yeah. are you willing to lose that spot of your empire? And in exchange, you get these resources, which I think, to your point, John, makes for such an interesting dynamic in the game because you're like, well, am I willing to destroy my number two area? You know, And every spot is worth points, so you're like, okay, am I willing to destroy it? And Maybe I can rebuild it but I'm going to get all these resources and you need those resources to then bid defend the, against the next one. Yeah, like, and there's like the, 20 see, of I these coming in or something. I, know. <laughs> I can't even find the language. It's like, you're both bidding, you're bidding on defending from taking the thing. But then when you take these cards that, or when you destroy these slots, then you get a special ability that you can put on another area. So that's, that's like what makes for such a weird emotional and stressful dynamic in this game and it kind of you know to what nick was saying it's just it it, it could be really fun because you could sort of be, it is fun because you're like yeah. okay fine i'll destroy i'll destroy this side of my town and i don't need that road but man i'm gonna make this other spot really great but then suddenly that other spot is being threatened and you're like i can't possibly lose this so i need to like i have to bid as high as possible and then i'm giving all these resources away so it's just it's it's fascinating because in our first game, I I thought the goal of the game was like, not the goal, but I thought everyone's empire was just going to be ruined by the end. And so yeah. I like let my entire empire burn. Yes. And, you know, Nick's like, you, no one's going to, empire is going to entirely burn. Like, mm, I think it could. Yeah, I think <laughs> two thirds of your empire did. was gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like by the end, I was like burning sections just to stay alive with like, I, it was, I was encroaching from both sides. And uh, so the second game I played a lot more defensively, but I think it, it is true that John was much more attacked. Like he did not want to let parts of his world like go. Anything. And, and yeah, yeah, because you do, you get kind of attached to it. So there's a lot of really interesting little dynamics kind of running in this game. Yeah. One thing that I want to talk a little bit, I mean, John, you mentioned no thanks and Anastasia, you mentioned bid and auction. I actually think that rulebook even does call it an auction or bidding or something. I don't know. Mm. And one thing that I find really interesting is when I hear auction, I generally think about like what happens in most real life auctions, right? Where it's like, I'll pay more, I'll pay more, I'll pay more until someone's like, I'll pay the $150,000. And then they pay that amount of money and no one else pays anything. Uh, but that's not what happens in this game. Really what happens as we go around is like, would you like to pay one for something bad to not happen to you? And the answer is yes pretty much always yeah. until the point where you're like, well, if I say that I don't want to pay one, then I'm going to take all of the resources that everybody else paid one for before this, including yourself. And you're kind of getting that including back. Including yourself. Yeah. Right. It just kind of accumulates over the, the course 
um, of the round is everyone's saying, mm, no, I'll pay one. Mm, no, I'll pay one. And then those things kind of accrue until the point where someone says, all right, well, I'll take the bad thing, but I also get all these resources along with that, which is, which is really just the no thanks mechanism. If you have played no thanks, this game yeah. is, is a complicated no thanks, right? Yeah. It just, it takes that same core loop and, and adds uh, a couple aspects to it, which is pretty neat. I actually, I'm, I haven't seen that, uh, particular mechanism being used in other games and i think that it is well executed in this game thematically i don't really know that it makes a ton of sense and it also doesn't really matter like the <laughs> idea that i'm just like waiting until like oh yeah there's a ton of food for me to take if i allow this pestilence to come in like, yeah <laughs> or it's like is, is it like a meteor that we're all like hot potatoing around with our like magic yeah. or something i don't i don't know I, I i actually i did one of those like things where you like you really stretch the theme in your mind where i was like well no because if this area is getting destroyed then all the people and resources from this region had to move over to this region and so that's why these other regions get skill sets or these other regions get these things or people were sending aid because i was destroyed like i in yeah. my mind i sure. was there i was like found myself being surprisingly thematic but i think part of that is the ownership that i did feel yeah. over my 11 slot town right like understanding that you know it wasn't going to survive unscathed uh, particularly in our in the second game we played um which after the first game i think this is one of those games that takes a play or two to kind of understand the pacing uh because in, it's a long track there's a lot of destruction i mean you <laughs> kind of go in along it and you're like okay cool so we have three more destructions no actually four more destructions and then maybe we'll get a little bit of resources back but by that point everything's basically destroyed so we're really not getting much like so you spend uh, the majority part of the game did we figure out how many auctions take place it depends on the player count it's a lot it's a lot (laughs) it's it's like you know a a, a couple dozen or something like that yeah yeah so you, you you do feel this like i guess i felt this like ownership over my town knowing that these things are going to happen. And so I don't know. I, I think that that lends itself to like kind of digging a little deeper into the theme if you want to, but it is, it is, I don't want to, I don't want to oversell it. It is, it's a Euro with a, with a theme. Yeah. Pasted on there. <laughs> One thing I really liked about it was, um, which does exist in uh, No Thanks as well, is the asymmetric incentives um, that, that happen in this game. You know, all of our um, empires start out identical at the very beginning. But uh, as soon as like literally one turn happens and, you know, one person has something get burned, things start to get asymmetric. They, you know, they don't care about one spot anymore because it burned already to a certain extent. Um, Well, I guess the burning can kind of spread, but they also got some asymmetric benefit. And then there's also ways that you may move your slots around. And there are ways that you may be forced to move your slots around. And that just jostles everything. And and when you're forced to move your slots around, it's like, you know, take your, your second best uh, slot and move it to the the third slot or something like that. And my second best might be different than Nick's second best because, you know, his best got destroyed already or something like that. So by surprisingly quickly, you get to the point after just a few auctions where, you know, a thing comes out and it's threatening spot five and spot five is worth 25 points to me and it's only worth seven points to Anastasia and it's worth mm-hmm. 14 points to Nick. And... It, it, not even considering the potential bonuses we have put underneath those and combos that might be reacting to other things. And so now, you know, in, in that situation, um, I super care. Like, I don't want to lose my whatever 25 points. And Anastasia is like, I don't mind losing three points at all. I will take this mountain of resources that John is terrified to, like, to take because it's such an asymmetric um, incentive structure and and because of that maybe Anastasia keeps pushing her luck hoping she can squeeze just one more thing out of me but then what if she pushes too far and I can't afford it well well then I guess I lose 25 points so she's not too unhappy about <laughs> <it>. <laughs> <laughs> and you know there's a huge yeah. silver lining um, usually when you uh, you know have the destruction hit your town and that is that you you get a bunch of stuff <laughs> and you're like okay I think I think that the way this game does that executes the the asymmetry that's built out is is very well implemented. Um, I especially noticed when we were playing in our four player game that there were often times where it was, was like two of us had changed from the base thing, but two of us had very similar to kind of like what the starting setup was. Yeah, and that is really neat that the game has enough points of contact to say, hey, you're going to switch the locations of these cards or you'll have innovated or upgraded these cards um, to be a little bit better over here. And so that matters more to you than it does to another player. 
but it doesn't do it so chaotically that it's exhausting or annoying. Um, it also doesn't do it so chaotically that you are always in a situation where everyone's circumstances look totally different. And so that requires you to pay attention. That's the interaction component of the game is paying attention to other folks and saying, hey, what is important here? Yeah, but one thing that does lend itself to is analysis and analysis can lead itself towards paralysis to a certain extent. <laughs> and um, it, it, we played this game twice and I think it, one was a three player game, one was a four. Both of them came in between 60 and 90 minutes, so it was not, it may be closer to 90. I think the four-player game was, was 90, um, so it wasn't a terribly long game. But as one of the resident analysis paralysis people, I can say that there were many times in this game, in these games, where I just sat there staring at my resources, and I'm like, do I spend a wheat here? And I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking like, okay, if I do that, I lose this amount of points. And, and if I don't, then Sage might take it and she gets that amount of points and this and that and the other thing and kind of bounce around. And ultimately, I generally, you know, the the, the fear of, of destruction won out and I would spend the wheat even if it was my last wheat and then I'd be just terrified it might come back around to me. But fortunately, Anastasia usually uh, took the bullets on those. Uh, <laughs> and I do want to note, Anastasia came dead last in the first game and crushed us in the second game using similar-ish vibes. Like, you still definitely <laughs> caught a lot of bullets in that second play, which was interesting. But this is just, like, especially near the end of the game, because there's a lot of end-game scoring on these cards as well. Um, in that second play, um, my best slot, I think it's like 32 points or something like that, had two end-game victory point things stacked up underneath it that just made, like, one of my resources worth a ton of points. And so that's one of the reasons I was sweating bullets is because that one slot made or broke the entire game for me. Like I, like half of my points probably were baked into this one slot. Um, whereas in Asia, you were more spread out, but you also just had so many more end game points. And that's also th something to keep in mind. Like, okay, you know, if, if I, don't take this. Maybe Anastasia is forced to take it and it'll knock out that thing, which gives her points for her wheat. But I don't know how much wheat she has. And ah, like to a certain extent, like there's so much you can analyze that I tried to to come back to emotions and be like, well, I don't want my empire to burn. So I'm going to spend the wheat and be unhappy in about 45 seconds when it comes back around to me. Um, but sometimes it took me a long time to, to, to end up going with my <laughs> gut instinct, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that goes goes back to what we've been talking about, like this idea that this game is very emotionally stimulating, uh, yes. so to speak. I, I think like and I think that, you know, what I was saying earlier, too, about like the pacing of that game and also I think how we can all kind of bring different play styles to it. You know, I think that that when I was playing that first game with the three of us, I was playing in front of John and it was interesting because I didn't quite understand the pacing and I was, I think, trying to exert a little bit more control over my city. I actually ended up burning our empire to go into town and see it's an empire. It's an empire. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I took auctions too low. John wasn't taking auctions per se. Uh, Nick was, was grabbing auctions as soon as they got us. high. Yeah. And he was, so if I did pass, John would put in food, or John would put in a resource and then, and then Nick would take it. So it wouldn't even get back to me. So, so it's an interesting dynamic how the kind of the, 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 personalities. the seat order yeah. and personalities kind of play in. Because in the follow-up game, it was a four player uh, with our friend NJ and I, there was a different dynamic because I was sitting behind John. And so John's yeah. sort of strategy of just constantly putting things in <laughs> meant by the time it got to me, the pots were really attractive. And yeah. I also learned from that first game to wait, even if I knew I could take something and I was like, Oh, I don't care if this spot burns. I was like, well, great. That means I should wait this out as long as possible and see how much benefit I can get for it. I think I even had a rule where I was like in that four player game. Now I should, we should add this caveat in, in four players, there's just more resources, right? There are more auctions, but yes. there's also just more resources inherently. So if it does come back around to you, just the, the value add is just so much higher, which also I think uh, I'm sure we'll touch on this more, but I think I really enjoyed four player and I think that might be the best player count. I can only say that having played three and four, but I just so enjoyed that just the gain I was getting for the burning. It actually made the burning of my empire uh, better. Yeah. But my point is to say that like you would get these huge 
piles <laughs> of resources. And so then it, it became very attractive. And there was even a point at one point in the game where I think uh, by the nature of what we could see, it seemed like John was winning. He had the least amount of his empire burned. Right. And so in each of those slots we talked about are worth points. Some of them are huge amounts of points. And that can yeah. be very... I don't want to say deceptive, but it can be, a, it, it's a very strong consideration, you know, early on, particularly when you're like, okay, do I want to lose 25 points for this? And so Nick said to me, no, I, I think, I think we, I think you need to let John take, like, you weren't supposed to take that, right? Like I, I took the auction because it was just covered in resources. Yeah. And he was like, he was like, this was our chance to like burn John's actual but, town. Yeah, my city, worth 32, 32 points point or thing something. plus everything yeah. else. Yeah. And it was like the heart of his engine. And, and I was like, yeah, but Nick, there's just so much stuff here. It's so good <laughs> for me. It was like, so good I for just, you. it was so good for me. Like, yes, it was an opportunity. So it creates also an interesting dynamic at the table because it, I think there is an element. It, it's, it's not a take that. And I want to be very careful to, to describe that because I don't want people to think this is a particularly mean game because it's not a mean game. It's sort of like, it, it's the fringe of that. I think, Well, the game can that, be mean. It's it, yeah, the, like, but exactly. the players the themselves been... like have moments to be a little bit mean, but it's yeah, but not directly because yeah. you don't know how many resources people has. You, yeah. you don't know if I can defend again or not, and if I can't, you don't. Well, you know, you didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that, and also like, if, it, even if John had taken it right, like if, if we had destroyed it, he would have then gotten this massive pile of resources, and so it, it's not necessarily always bad for him because then he could have maybe done something differently with those right. and. You know, to drop back to your point, John, with all of those resources, I had all sorts of cards that, not all sorts, but I had created a tableau that really benefited me for having the food at the end of the game. Yeah, and like so four points at the end of the game of for every food you had. And you exactly. took like 12 food. It was insane. I had like 20 food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like at the yeah. end. So like, yeah. And so for me, I was like, yeah, sure. I could, John could lose all these points, but this is like you know, 48 points of food for me. Like, I'm, t I'm taking it. Yeah. And when winning scores seem to be in the high 100s, like, you know, 180 to 200 or so, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot. Exactly. So just, again, really, really interesting dynamics at the table amongst both each other and, and, and you know, your own interaction with your tableau. Yeah. Yeah, John made a comment, I think, quite along the same lines of that Anastasia at the end of our first play that um, it felt it reminded him a lot of the modern art dynamic, where, yeah. which is a game that really yeah. cares about the metagame of the players at the table. And uh, you largely want to be in sync with the, the groupthink of your table. Um, and, you know, you could be really good at this game at your table and go sit down at another play table. And the way that they play the game, you know, maybe they don't let resources a pile in the same way or they you know the opposite right they really really just pile everything on there and it might be that the way you play this game uh is actually quite disastrous for, for their strategy and that's i think that's very good right that the game has um has has a a flexibility uh in strategy based on the world around you it means that you need to like pay attention to what's going on what the like table vibe is it's just as important um, in this game to like say hmm do i think that you're gonna put more resources on there if i pass right now uh yeah. and you brought that what up earlier anastasia yeah yeah exactly you're you were like okay this isn't bad i'll take this but really the question you're asking yourself is this isn't bad but are you two not gonna take it yeah. because i would like to <laughs> really pump this piggy bank full if i can exactly yeah, yeah. And, and you know every resource we spend into that is less defense we have against the future as well. Exactly, exactly. And I think that I, I'm someone, you know, we've said this multiple times. I, I don't, I like to build my sandcastle. I don't want anyone to kick it over. Uh, and if anyone's going to kick it over, then I want to kick it over. Right. And <laughs> I, I think I've also said though, that if we go into a game where I have zero control, I often, you know, bring up Grand Austria Hotel as my ex like kind of trademark example for this, you know, that the inherent luck of the dice means that I'm going to have very little control. I'm going to do my best to build the best thing I can despite that. Right. And I think that's how I ended up going to the second play of this, which is I was like, cool, not all of this empire is going to survive, but how am I going to mitigate that? Like what is going to be the most important to me? And then 
what am I going to lose? Right. And so like, I was like very careful to be like, cool. The only thing I want to keep is like these two or three areas. And, and then I prioritize them, you know, I was like, this is the most important and this is the least. And then, you know, and then I, I, I told myself I have to be malleable as things happen because I may get in a situation where I don't have enough resources and I'm going to have to lose a spot. But I was very careful in doing that to, to kind of pay attention to my resource counts and to kind of know that I was always kind of prepared to protect what I needed. I felt I needed to protect, but there was a good portion of my empire I was willing to lose in order to do that. And so it's sort of like, I don't know if this is the right use of this term, but like diminishing returns, like at different points in this game, you're going to have a number of points and then you're going, you're just going to kind of constantly be losing them and then trying to get them back. And so it's like, I guess I was always kind of looking at it as like, cool as long if I have these five slots then I'm gonna get a ton of points but if I only have these three I'll still get a bunch it's just kind of like what am I willing to lose does that that make sense and there are ways to rebuild your empire we we haven't mentioned that but like there are a few emphasis on few moments that you can spend one of the resources to unburn one of your spots so that is also a consideration there were there were a couple times uh, where I was like really, really worried about a thing, you know, I kept paying to not take a thing, and then like I saw Anastasia take it, and then we immediately went into an empire building thing, and she just like re- rebuilt it, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I guess I could yeah. have probably done that too. I mean, again, asymmetric uh, incentives, maybe hers was cheaper to rebuild than mine, but like I was so terrified of of destroying anything that I I kind of forgot that you know, well, you you can repair these things, so, and it, it, to a certain extent. I mean, it takes a lot of resources to repair the really lucrative ones, but you can get a lot of resources off of your opponents <laughs> from these auctions. So it's interesting. Yeah. One thing that we, um, since we are talking about points that I, I do want to bring up is that mostly in this game, your points are going to be the parts of your tableau that haven't burned. But there are a handful of the innovations that you can get that give you end game scoring. And it's yep. mostly for having XYZ leftover resources at the end of the game. And I was very pleasantly surprised in this, in the, the most recent game that we played, the four player game, um, because I had the the quote unquote best tableau, right? The least burned empire at the mm-hmm. end of the round, and I came up, I came in third place, and yeah. I actually thought that was a really cool aspect of the game. I think after our first game, it felt like it was just going to be don't let your stuff burn and make sure you like do the auctions in such a way that you have enough resources to not let the important things burn. And that's how you're going to win. And then right. after this second play, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Like actually like paying attention to those other end game scoring conditions um, does help, does matter, does change the way that you're going to evaluate certain piles and I just I liked that because I, I thought it was going to be a little bit more straightforward in the scoring. And I think it it, it it expands the the strategic approach in a game that is largely very, very tactical. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I don't think you can undersell that really like that. This really is like it's a it's a good quality euro underneath there. There is a lot of different little elements to think about, whether it is, you know, your tableau or how you are managing those auctions or what you're burning or to John's point, what you're rebuilding. I mean, there was this kind of pivotal point at the end of our, of that four player game where it was like, do I take this massive pile of resources? And I actually, um, because it's something we do, we, you know, we do a lot of table talk. I was, I was actually, it was Nick and I were kind of evaluating it because it was like, it was going to burn one of my 25 point areas. And it's the last turn of the game. And so Nick was like, is that good for you? And I was like, well, I have enough resources to immediately rebuild it. And I was then going to get a bunch of food. And I've mentioned that, you know, food is worth, you know, a whole bunch of points to me at the end of the game. So I was like, there's actually a world here where I can burn this, rebuild it and still come out on top. And very much so that yeah. is, I think to go back to what you were saying, John, about like AP, I'm sure I could have sat there and like, taken a Nick's board and seeing how valuable it was to him, which I didn't realize in the moment. So it really was the right decision. He told me that later, or I could have tried to consider how negative is it for John, if he has to take it or is this good for, you know, NJ, like there was these elements at play. And I think that there is a dynamic to this game where you want, you, you have the ability to, to see all these different like layers playing out. And I, I agree with you, Nick, that it's like really fun to kind of be like, cool how can I make these cards work or how can I make these different dynamics work but there also is like um kind of a, a nice I don't want to say it's not pacing or like it's not really breezy but like there there kind of comes a point where 
you, like you were saying, John, you kind of just have to get into the emotion of it. We're like, yeah. I don't know. This like big pile. It, it seems like this is better for me if I do this and then I can burn and rebuild and like, let's do it. And then you do that. And if you can calculate all of the benefits of that in the moment, that's fantastic. And that is what is provided for you there. But I think it's also a game that you can just kind of like take that in and then move on to the next thing. You can make more of a heuristic decision, I think, is, is yeah. that what you're kind of like getting? Yeah, you, you can play the game a little bit more by feel or a little bit more by math. And in the example that you brought up, it was like the end of the game. It was like the final auction or whatever, which is like where you're going to default to to leaning a little bit more on math. Yeah. Um, but you did mention breezy in there. You said not breezy. And that made me want to bring up the thing that was my that's my biggest issue with this game and yeah. that is the um john mentioned ap earlier about like thinking about like do i want to spend another wheat and i actually in playing this game never once was annoyed or bored while someone was thinking about what did they want to pay on a certain bit because i could think to myself well i'm next and so if they pay one then i'm going to be doing this on my turn like i still could be engaged in those moments or mm, i think anastasia is going to take it before me so i really don't even think about it anyway <laughs> but the thing that really bothered me was at the end of any disaster you claim the card and then you take the innovation and slide it under another one of your cards and the game cannot continue until you have done that and that was the part that really bothered me. For a game that felt like the gameplay is pretty smooth, flip this disaster, bid, 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 resolve, let's flip the next disaster, bid, 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 bid. You know, that's the tempo that I want to play this game at. But the problem was we would bid, 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 bid. And then now, hmm, do I want to put this over here underneath my seven because it's next to the road? Or do I want to put it over here underneath my nine because the resources there match a little bit better? And what's coming up next on the track? Oh, it's the, the swords thing next. So I don't know if I quite want that one. And then I would be sitting there waiting, and this is going to sound really uh, small and petty, but like 10 or 15 seconds while someone is doing that. Um, and in a game where you're doing 30, 40 auctions over the course of the game, that really adds up to a point that like, instead of being a breezy, smooth playing game, there were just these yeah. like starts and stops yeah. that that got in the way of my enjoyment a bit. Yeah, that does make sense. And part of that too is 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 actually a neat part of the game. And that is that frequently, especially in a four player game, you have double disasters where everybody is is fending off at the start two disasters at the same time and you could potentially have one disaster hit you take those resources and then use one of those resources to immediately pay off the other one which is a cool tactical decision and a really good way to bake a bunch of these uh auctions into the game but if i take one of them to have resources to pay off the other one i i, I pause the entire other auction to make that decision as well. Um, it, yeah. th that definitely felt like a situation like where maybe those should have been slotted in like after all of the auctions are done. It seemed like the biggest offenders were the first out of two in those double auctions, at least as far as like, you know, hitting the, the potential breeziness of the game. Yeah. And it's funny because I really like the control that that gives you. You know, we talked a lot about like, how do you kind of mitigate like, you know what's happening and is this tactical is this strategic is this so i like the control that you get by getting to choose where this goes in your empire the upgrade and i like the the upgrade the innovation and i but i also i like some of the other elements we talked about which is opportunities to move different slots in your empire around and different things that kind of come up over the course of the game but i will say that just from a like a stress or an emotion or this is such an emotional game from a like a bad feeling place i think what adds a lot to that ap is the fear that you're going to pick the wrong spot mm -hmm. that you're not going to be able to move it um even though there are some exceptions where maybe you can but like for the most part you're not going to be able to or that you didn't consider that this was about to get destroyed or that this could get destroyed or that you, like it it just it adds a uh, like a stress load, I think, to that decision that makes it into 10, 15, 30 seconds, a minute, you know, just trying to figure out like what is the right thing? What is going to be destroyed? How is that going to be destroyed? And so I, I like that, that element of control that it adds. But I, but I also think that's something, it, it is a, like a little bit of a stressor point in, in the game as well. when you're thinking about the emotional space that this, this game can kind of take up. But I don't know if you guys feel this way. I think with more plays, that would lessen, right? You get used to kind of the cards and you get used to the things that you're seeing 
And that thought process may or may not lessen. Or on the flip side, it could also increase because as you become more aware of the different strategies in the game, you might be more cognizant of like what you're trying to do. I think that depends kind of on the type of player you are. Yeah. I think it would smooth out largely. Yeah. yeah. I want to bring up one other kind of negative or, or kind of con that, that I felt with the game. And, and I would say overall, like I actually, I really, really enjoyed this game. I really like the dynamic and the elements and it was really fun to play. I mean, the, the, the stress side of it is, is a factor. And I think that, this is not going to be a game for everyone because of that. Um, and if you find ways to mitigate that, even like I did, like just embracing like, okay, well, as long as I can save this, that's, that, that's as good as I'm going to get. But I felt a lack of variability in the game. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that I brought it up and you guys both said to me, well, the tableau is what's variable because, uh, you know, these, these 11 slots, the starting locations, if you will, they change every game. They just come out randomly you all have the same setup but it's going to be different and and the slots do different things and so there's an element of that but the the track the fact that the track doesn't change and i'm i know that it's i'm sure that it's like perfectly fine-tuned so exactly the right amount of disasters come out and the pacing but it's i think that there's uh, i just felt like a little bit like i wanted that track to be a little bit different or offer something a little bit new or even there's a couple different spots, but like we've talked about, I think like two thirds of the track, maybe 70% of the track is just disaster. So yeah. like there can be a, a little bit of repetition too in that like a lot of this game is just auctioning off those disasters. And then in addition to that, it, it does almost feel like a little long too for how many of those seem to come out. It just seems like, I, I guess I just, I I like that I was like, building up something but there there was like a little bit of i don't know i don't say sameness i I don't want to overemphasize this because this game does feel like it has a lot of replayability and and i definitely see that and i could see myself playing it a bunch of times it's just there is just something like uh, i i think i just wanted that track to be able to be a little bit different or to offer something a little bit different i just kind of found myself sort of being like okay we're doing kind of just doing the same thing over and over. I don't know if you guys felt any of that. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that it is replayable, but not variable. Um, I think the fact that in a four player game, you will go through all 66 disaster cards is a little weird, right? Like I don't feel like I should have control or knowledge over impending disasters. (laughs) (laughs) I guess you're right. You could, you could account for all. Yeah. 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 I mean, it doesn't really matter if you know like what type of disaster is coming out, but it does matter what the innovations are. And so I might at a certain point be like, ah, there are six end game innovations that pay you for food. And I have collected such and such, and I don't see these other ones in play. So there are still some in the deck and that control, uh, it does feel a little odd for the idea of like barbarians are coming and burning your lands like, <laughs> yeah. on on this schedule at three o'clock we'll see you at nine <laughs> o'clock we'll give you a break so that you can you know till the, the wheat and all that stuff <laughs> no nick they only attack during certain seasons obviously <laughs> seasons my bad <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, they could have done like a, you know, a random card deck to reveal, you know, what's happening now. Oh, it's a disaster. What's happening now? Oh, it's a economy phase. But I, I could also see that, like, th- that could be more thematically make sense, but also could also be frustrating. Like, it might no, just not work. Yeah, yeah there, there's part definitely a part of this game, like planning ahead. Like, one of the events that happens is uh, this kind of sword showing contest where you like count up the swords <laughs> that you have war. yeah war, <laughs> war. <laughs> war yeah. you're all being destroyed but yes. you still need to go to war but you still need to other, fight each course. other and uh and it's a it's a one-time blind auction of a axe resource plus some static things over there and there were it seemed like a strange amount of times where the final disaster before one of these cost axes and so that was a big factor in the incentives as well it's like okay well there's six axes if, if i take this disaster i get six axes back and literally the moment after we do that we're going to be doing a blind auction for axes and the person who does the better in that is going to get the you know more points and whatnot and so like that was also a consideration whereas if the the next war phase or whatever was was a bunch of you know turns away 
that incentive would be different, I guess. And that's that's just random. Like the the disaster needing axes right before the war was random. It just seemed like that happened several times. I guess there are only three main resources, so it's not too unlikely. Yeah, no, but it it definitely is a factor. And that kind of goes back to why I'm so sort of like torn on making this point because it's like there are a lot of ways... I love how you said that, Nick, about how it's like it's very replayable but not super variable. But there, and yet there, I think one could definitely argue that there is a lot of variety in these like kind of subtle little ways. The innovations, primarily. Yeah, the innovations, or just the dynamic of the things we've talked about—the dynamic of the play table, the dynamic of the player order, the dynamic of your empire, the dynamic of the different resources being required when. So there are those elements. And and yet, you know, I, I think I still felt that, but I also don't know that I would change that because part of what makes this game also, I can say that it feels like a, a, like a finely tuned Euro game with a lot of tactical <laughs> and strategic decisions is because of what I imagine was a, you know, highly playtested board that, that does make for a you know, a, uh, a game that is long enough for you to be able to build up enough tableau points in your tableau that there are multiple paths to victory. It does allow for a certain amount of disaster and then other things that happen. It does let you plan ahead. You, you do know what's coming and you are able to know not where it's coming, but you do know how many disasters you're going to have to survive. You know, so it's like for as much as I think I wish it had I can sit here and say like, oh, I wish it had more of like a pandemic style, you know, uh, you know, event deck, if you will, uh, that, you know, I, I kind of know how many epidemics are coming, but I don't know when that would completely tear apart the strategy, the strategy. Yeah. yeah. So and, you know, I imagine in success, this game could have multiple boards or multiple kind of ways of playing could be a little bit like um concordia potentially where there could be other maps if you will um that could play differently and i'm i i don't know where it's headed but i think that might be fun to see yeah so one thing i think both of you have hinted at um is uh the game being maybe slightly longer than you wanted expected something like that and i mentioned earlier that like our four-player game was you know 90-ish minutes maybe it was 100 minutes but not terribly long like when you count the seconds, but from an emotional perspective, where I land with it is it is a fatiguing game, uh, like 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 mentally fatiguing game. And uh, we played this twice, and I think both times at about the three-quarter mark, I just remember sitting here being like, I kind of wish the game was about to end right now, not because I wasn't having fun, not because, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, I was like, oh, you, can you know. only the, hang on for so long, Yeah, I was John. just like, oh my gosh, we have eight more the town's auctions. Gotta burn. I've got one axe, I have two food, I've got two coins, and there's eight auctions. <laughs> and just like, you know, that that like stress, anxiety and whatnot. Like it, it seemed like both times we played, if it had ended at the, the 75% mark instead of the 100% mark, I would have been okay with that. But again, I think that was mostly because then I could just like take a breath and be like, okay, cool. This is my final score. This is how I did. And I think that says a lot to like the theming that like a Euro can, can, it can spark those kind of emotions. But also at the same time, you know, if I'm going to sit down to play this game, uh, which I do hope to play more in the future, I, I, I also know that I'm going to have to be in a mental space <laughs> for it. Uh, even It's not a crunchy game, but it's a fatiguing one for me. Yeah. And another thing, and I think this is uh, this is kind of what happened to Anastasia in the first game, is that uh, it's a game where you can fall into a little bit of a trap if you're if you let yourself go broke, like totally broke. Yeah. Uh, then you can be stuck taking cards or bids or auctions or whatever you want to call them with very few resources on them, which does not give you a lot of rope to survive the succeeding events and so right. all the way at the beginning anastasia said it might take you a play or two to get the tempo of this game and i think that like hey going to zero is a very very scary place to be <laughs> yeah um yeah. An and just, uncontrolled burn i'll warn you in advance a... if you're playing <laughs> if you're playing this game <laughs> i will say though like to go back to like the emotional aspect you know I did that in our first play, right? And 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 I remember at the time, like equating it 
to a game to beyond the sun which i often bring up as my example of a game where i played the first time and i was like i I just i I really enjoyed the experience and at the end i was like so frustrated because i didn't understand the tempo and the points and what i was trying to do and that's basically how i felt at the end of the first game of this where i was basically like great i thought i was doing all of these things and then suddenly my whole empire has burned and i don't like i have nothing to show for it and not only that Nick and John have double my points. Like it was a, it was a sad, sad <laughs> showing. Yeah, you and, were surprised. You know, I, yeah. And, but the reason I made that comparison is because when I, I love Beyond the Sun. It's one of my favorite games now. And, and I have done, you know, uh, in, in subsequent plays, when I understood the game, it really clicked for me. And that's, I think, what happened here with Empire's End as well is just, that element of sure you can burn your empire you just need to kind of know what you're doing when you do it so make sure it's and worth it <laughs> exactly and understanding better of where the points could come from i noticed very quickly that food seemed to be um the resource you needed most which thematically makes sense right for the auctions um, yeah yeah for the auctions and so i had in that first game kind of focused on like axes and military thinking that that would like pay out like no it didn't like (laughs) you needed food and having lots of food was really beneficial and so i kind of focused on that and then i i tried to take disasters that get benefits for that and then that ended up working out you know i think at the end of my game i had i I had like 92 points in 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 points i got from resources and when you think about how many points your tableau is worth the beginning i don't know off the top of my head but you know, it that's a significant amount of points. That was my t- total score. I think was in like the two, I two guess or three or something like that. Yeah, and I think it was yeah, it was, it was two sixteen, and that was a significant portion of that score. And so that was from building the tableau. And you know, something that I saw our friend NJ do is he like he was like three cards deep on each of his parts of his empire. Like he went full hog on tableau. And even though it was his first game in that four player game that we played he still had a really respectable score because of that. And I can see like, there's just a lot of different ways to play. Like watching him do that. I was like, Oh, how interesting. Like I want to go deeper on a couple of areas next time too. So it's like just a lot of dynamics in this game that, um, that I think would come out of multiple plays. And I do think it's a game that, that kind of really wants that from you. Yeah. Well, speaking of playing this game, I I do want to mention that it doesn't exist yet. Uh, I think I should probably mention that. Like, it, it just went up on Kickstarter. It, it ended like a month ago or so. I backed the campaign w- before we actually played it, and so I'm glad that I enjoyed it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's kind of an interesting situation where like this won't physically exist. I don't know for a year or something. I'm not sure what their timetable is, but um, it, it is one that uh, we've we've been playing. You know, obviously on Tabletop Simulator. And and I'm I'm quite curious to see what it's going to be like in person, you know, with the resources and everything, you know, because uh, all the resources are hidden and, you know, the ability to lean across the table and look and see what somebody's tableau looks like is going to be a little bit different than when you're essentially playing a video game and you could just, you know, look over there and zoom in. Um, it's it's an interesting consideration anyway. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think this is a really cool game. I, I have to admit, like. I really enjoyed myself. I haven't seen any mechanics quite like this. I'd never played No Thanks. Now I really yeah. We want should to totally actually. play No Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I, um, but so I guess the closest I'd gotten to this is High Society has a similar kind of hmm. like I don't want that, so I'm going to kind of bid <laughs> bid to get that off of me. Sure. Yeah, um, that's a good. I, I like that comparison quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and so I like that. I really enjoy seeing elements of that at play. I liked once I kind of it clicked for me. I just there's just like a, just a lot of facets of this that I liked. I do think that that emotional space, that stress, is not going to be for everyone. It is stressful. Right. There is a tension that makes it fun. It's like a scary movie. Like you like can't look away. Uh, but that also is a factor. I know that this is a game that my partner would not enjoy at all. This would just not be fun for us. So yeah. it's probably not a game that like I am going to run out and get. But if I was over at John's or I someone had this, like I would absolutely play this, particularly at four players. I just think that for 
for some seasoned Euro gamers that would enjoy a kind of <laughs> destruction-y evening like this, I, I think, you know, even for the kind of faults I, I said about like sort of the length and some of the variability, I just think it's for 90 minutes, that for me is a sweet spot for a game. And I just think that it's it's a good time for, yeah. especially if for like a backwards auction situation, I I would very happily play this anytime that it's it's put in front of me yeah i agree yeah for sure all right well i think that's gonna wrap up everything we have to say on this one uh as john mentioned it was uh recently a kickstarter campaign so if you want to go check that out i don't know if they're doing late pledges or if, if by the time you're listening to this the game is out but you know if you're interested you can go find that uh, we'll put a link to that in the description and until next time Happy gaming. Bye. Bye. Bye.